Good morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the book of Judges in the Old Testament. If you've not been with us, have been working us through the book of Judges for some time now, and we're uh, moving our way through the book to today, this morning, the last major judge in Judges. We've covered five already to this point, and today we come to number six, uh, and he is Samson. We're going to cover Samson in two sermons, so next time I preach we'll uh, look at the end of the Samson story. Today we're going to look at Judges chapter 13 to 15. We're going to cover three chapters. I'm not going to read all three chapters, so I've uh, picked out a selection of uh, sections through this story just to kind of give us sort of bearing in what is the Samson story. A wild and wonderful and weird story as ever. Maybe the weirdest we've seen yet, which is kind of hard to believe. Judges 13 to 15, we're going to look at, uh, if you want to jot these down, I believe they're in their, their, your bulletin as well. But Judges 13, 1 to 5, Judges 14, 1 to 7, verses 19 and 20 of chapter 14, and then finally chapter 15, verses 11 to 15. I typically hate to do that, breaking up into little sections, that's confusing, but uh, if we're going to cover three chapters, this is kind of how we have to go about it. So, Judges 13-15, to let me read and pray and then we'll dive into it together. And a reminder as we read that this is the inspired and errant Word of the living God. These are the only sinless words you'll hear from my mouth today as I read this text. Judges 13, verses 1-5 to first. This is God's Word. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. There was a certain man of Zorah from the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of God. Of the Philistines. Skipping to head to chapter 14, 1 to 7. Samson, now grown up, went down to Timnah. And at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At the time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces, as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. Skipping down to verse 19. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, that being Samson, and he went down to Ashkelon, and struck down thirty men of the town, and took their spoil, and gave the garments to those who had told told the riddle. In hot anger he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Skipping to 15, verses 11 to 15. Then three thousand men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam, and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to him, As they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, We have come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. 
And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it. And with it he struck 1,000 men. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, so much in these three chapters, so much to cover, so much to look at, so much to understand. We pray that by Your grace this morning, through the work of the Spirit in our hearts and our minds, that You would help us to learn from this text, not to be distracted by all of the details, not to be distracted by the things both inside this building and outside. But Father, we ask that in these moments we have together that we might be able to sit under Your Word, that we might sit at the feet of Jesus and we might learn, we might hear, we might receive, and we might rest. We pray that You would nourish Your people in this time, that we would hear the good news even in this strange and weird and violent text. We pray that anybody among us that does not know Christ, any in this room who have never come in contact with the true Savior, that they might, even this morning, would You do a mighty work in this place in our midst. Father, we thank You that You love us. We thank You that You are among us and that You've spoken to us by Your Word. It's in Christ's name we thank You and we pray. Amen. So as I mentioned this morning, we are on to the sixth and final judge in the book of Judges, sixth final major judge. We've seen minor judges as well. And we are kind of working our way through the narrative. And and if you've been with us, what we've seen through the book of Judges so far are two essential truths, two things that I believe the book of Judges holds out for us that are, uh, as I've compared to, kind of two wings of an airplane. On one wing, it is that we, me and you, all of us are in great need of a Savior. When it comes down to it, when it comes into our lives, the reality is is that our insecurities, our sin, our struggle, everything that we have in our lives are first not out there. They are in here. Your heart and my heart are the problem. But the other wing of the plane, just as essential and important, is that there is a great Savior for our need and we have a God who is willing to go to incredible lengths to redeem His people. And we will see that certainly today. Amazingly, when you consider some of the things that we've seen together, just let's just talk about the things we've seen judges do, much less what we've seen, period. We've seen a judge carrying around the heads of two Midianite princes. We've seen a judge burning hundreds of his own people alive in a pagan temple. We've seen a judge sacrifice his own daughter to appease the God of Israel. We've seen some things, people seen some things, and yet today we get to Samson, and I'm not sure we've seen anything quite like Samson. We've seen some mess we're about to see perhaps even more. Samson, in many ways, judges, saves the worst for last. We've seen this downward spiral of Israel as they've gone further and further from the Lord, closer and closer to the abyss, and in a few weeks we'll get to the abyss. The end of Judges is horrifying, but we're going to see this We've seen this downward spiral. I've compared it to kind of like a flushing toilet where the water just keeps on going down as it spins. And man, do we see in Samson the, the end, of that, end of that cycle. In a book of broken anti-heroes, Samson stands alone. He is very deliberate in his pursuit of paganism. He is clearly a sex addict. He's clearly an alcoholic. He's violent, he's narcissistic, he's impulsive. He's everything that you don't want in a hero. Everything that you don't want in a hero. Uh, and his story is weird and wild. I encourage you this week, as I, as I said, whenever we cover this much text, and I think it was the smart way to cover it, but whenever we cover this much text, there's a lot that we have to skip over. So I encourage you to go and read the story of Samson this week. Verse, uh, chapters 13 to 16. He gets more coverage than anybody in the book of Judges. He gets four chapters. I encourage you to go and read the story of Samson. 
I encourage you to go and know the story of Samson, love the story of Samson, be weirded out and creeped out and grossed out by the story of Samson, all of the things that come with it. As I was thinking through this text um, and, and, and thinking through sort of what we see from both Samson and from the Israelites in these chapters, I was reminded of a story I heard a few years ago that has become one of my favorites. Quick caveat, anybody who's spent any amount of time around the youth ministry at Metaview has definitely heard this story, so I apologize if you're hearing this for a second time. There was a woman uh, years ago, so the story goes, that had this gigantic pet python. She kept a giant python in her house as a pet, and she slept with the python. She slept with the pet python in her bed every night, and she, uh, she did this for years. There was, however, at one point, mysteriously, out of nowhere, this snake stopped eating and started behaving kind of weirdly, right? It was kind of lethargic, didn't really move, didn't really do anything, was not eating for months at a time. The, the rats or mice or whatever would just kind of stay there in the, the cage, whatever. So after a while, this woman becomes concerned about her pet snake, and so she takes the snake to the vet and goes and meets with the vet and describes kind of what's happening. And after a while, the vet sits down with her and says, I need to be brutally honest with you. What this species of snake will do is that it will starve itself when it begins to prepare for a big meal. Right? This snake who she had been sleeping to, sleeping next to for, for months, right, was preparing, in essence, to devour her if you didn't connect the dots on that. It's a horrible, horrible, horrifying, scary story, um, but one that I think has stuck with me for many, many, many reasons. Uh, I've been told it's kind of more urban legend than it is story. I don't know if it actually happened. Please don't fact check it, but I'm just saying it's a great story, and I'm a fan of great stories, so let's roll with that. So this woman's sleeping next to this snake that's starving itself for the, for the big meal to come. And, and what does this tell us? I think we see it here in Judges and something that we see, unfortunately, in our own lives as well, is that this woman had become so comfortable, so comfortable with that which was seeking to kill her. She was literally sleeping with the enemy. And if we're honest with ourselves, and I think we see this with Samson and we see this with the Israelites in this passage, that it is very easy for us to get lulled into a sense of comfort when it comes to sin, when it comes to slavery, when it comes to oppression, when it comes to that which seeks to kill us. We come, we get very comfortable around it to the point where we're sleeping with the enemy. Those things that were damaging become close companions. The, the thing that we see, the shocking reality from Judges 13-15, to 15, based on what we've seen from Judges, and really if you know anything at all about the Old Testament, this is even more shocking. The Israelites in this story do not want to be saved. They have no interest in it. Samson has no interest in being a Savior. None. And yet, what do we see in this story that is remarkable? It's the fact that even though these people don't want to be saved, even though they don't want a Savior, God intervenes. Over and over and over again, God steps into the picture and He's like, I don't care if you don't want to be saved, I'm going to save you anyway. (laughs) Because you're my people. I know better than you. And, and it's really, I think, this is just such a beautiful snapshot of what is not just the story of Judges, but the story of the Bible as a whole. We heard it in our call to worship earlier. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't want Him, but He came for us anyway. And So I want to examine that this morning, those points as we look through the text, and those will be our two points if you're a note taker and want to follow the outline in your bulletin. Number one, we don't want salvation. Number two, God saves us anyway. We don't want salvation. Point two, God saves us anyway. Our passage opened in a very familiar way. If you're used to Judges, this is the seventh time in the book of Judges we've seen this phrase at the beginning of chapter 13. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And we see this, that's played out. We talked earlier in Judges about the cycle 
that plays out each time the people of Israel do evil. They drift away from the Lord. The Lord brings in a foreign invader to kind of take over, right? To oppress them. And we see this in chapter 13. The Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Right? And so we see this playing out time and time again. Now, a couple of interesting things to note before we move on. First of all, the Philistines you may be familiar with. We're going to see them pop up a lot in the Israel story. They become a pretty persistent thorn in the side of the Israelites. We're going to see them well into the years of Saul and David. Goliath is a Philistine. We're going to see this play out, right? So the Philistines now, they step kind of onto the stage at this point in Judges and we're, they're not going to go away anytime soon. They're a, they're a real problem. The other thing that I think is worth noting and the other thing that I want to zoom in on a little bit here is what is not here. If you've been paying attention to the cycle, people of Israel do what's evil. God sends a foreign invader. And what's usually the next step? The people of Israel cry out. People of Israel cry out. Whether it's full-blown repentance or just a, a desperate kind of plea for help in the midst of a bad situation. Right? But notice in verse 13, or verse 1 of chapter 13, the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. And we move on. No crying out. No pleas for help. No repentance, certainly not. The people of Israel have been doing this for so long. The people of Israel have been experiencing this for so long that they have now grown to the point where they no longer want deliverance. They're just living in it. Fine. Let the Philistines rule over us. That's fine. Right? There's sometimes in, we've seen this in Judges, we see this throughout the Bible, there's, there's like this, there's nothing louder than this kind of sound of silence from the text. <laughs> right? Nothing louder than the fact that the text does not tell us a detail that we are expecting and hoping for. I said last time we talked about Jephthah, and he puts his daughter up on the altar of sacrifice, and I said, you're kind of hoping for that, that sort of Isaac moment, right? Where, where the, the clouds break open, and he says, Jephthah, stop it. You, you really want to hear that, but there's not that. <laughs> It's just silence. He just does it. And here we see again, Israel is revi- uh, has resigned to their state of oppression. And if you don't believe me, then we can look at chapter 15. What we read in chapter 15, flip a couple pages ahead. After all of this with Samson, we'll get into what they've been doing, escalating between him and the Philistines, all of this. The men of Judah come to Samson as he's the only one who's been fighting against the bully. And they say what? What is this thing you've done to us? Stop it. Stop messing with them. Stop it. They're defending their oppressor. They're defending those who are ruling over them. We see this language. It's not the language of a conquered uh, uh, you know, people who are being oppressed. It's the language of a conquered people. We're just fine with it. And in fact, we're going to bind you and give you to them so that you stop it. We're going to let them do whatever they want with you because we want you out. It's like this one pastor referred to this as like a spiritual Stockholm syndrome. It's like that psychological kind of phenomenon where hostages will begin to sympathize with their captors. All right? And they'll begin to, to not just have sympathy, but will begin to, to defend them and, and all of this. And it's sort of that same kind of thing. Israel does not want help, <laughs> they don't want God. They don't want freedom they don't want deliverance they want what they have they want to settle in to the state that they're in they're comfortable and i i think if i'm honest and and i hope if you're honest as well we see something in this that we can relate to again that we see something that's very true of us because while we are not the israelites and 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 this is a different people the reality is is that we're viewing the, the, the human heart through the lens of judges. The human heart has not changed, unfortunately. So just in case you're not sure, we're the Israelites in the story, right? We, we do the same thing, and I'll give you a couple of illustrations to kind of flesh this out a little bit, because we love sort of the comfort, the familiarity, right, that comes with consistency, comes with kind of the status quo. Let's look at a couple of examples where we don't want to see God intervene. We don't want to see God take things from us. Maybe you're worshiping and you're, you're dealt with the, the false God of success. Success demands from you that at all times, 
you have this sort of constant state of ambition. You're willing to step on anybody's neck that you have to to get to the top of the mountain. Right? You have to always look for reasons to seek perfection. You have to be the one that wins. You have to be the one that has it. And that's where you're living. You're just living in that world. Right? And you're afraid at some level that God is going to come in and say, I'm going to take that off of you. And you're going to have to, at one point, admit failure. You're going to have to take a loss. And you're scared of that. At some level, you're scared of that because you've settled into this state where success is good enough for you. It's costly. What about the God of image? You like to look a certain way. You want to promote yourself and your family at different times. You're in this sort of constant state of managing your own PR. It's exhausting. But you have to continually do it. You're terrified that if God takes that away from you, you might have to admit that you don't have it together. You might have to associate with people that are not kind of the cool kids. As I've said before, we're all, all of us are just middle schoolers. We're just, we're just older. Like, that, we don't get out of middle school. All of us are there, right? You, don't want, you want to hang out with the cool kids. You want to hang out with the people that have it going on. God takes the God of image away. You might have to hang out with people that aren't the cool kids. That's a scary thing. That's a costly thing. Maybe your thing is the God of faith. Yes, your faith can be a God. Some people love to promote how faithful they are. They love to promote how spiritual they are. They love to promote uh, how godly they are. They can't do a devotional without posting about it on social media. All right? they got to post the, the Bible verse. Otherwise, the Bible verse doesn't matter. If you don't post it, does it even exist? All right? and, and some of you have wrapped up passionate Christian conviction in your, the way you school your kids or your politics or the way that you do church or the way that you spend your money. You've wrapped Christian conviction around these things so much so that you sort of subtly criticize people that don't hold the same convictions you do. You're using your faith as a weapon. Not in a good way. You're using your faith as a weapon. And you're afraid at some level that if God exposes that in you, you may have to admit that your faith is not strong enough to carry you through. You might have to admit that you don't have it. That you're dependent. You might have to admit that it's your calling not to live out your faith through social media posts and devotionals, but it, it's living out your faith through loving people with the Gospel. Which is hard and messy. You're scared of that. This is where we live. And, and, and I, I invite you to personalize this. I gave you three. There's plenty of examples of how we do this where we love to, to, to just get comfortable in our, our idolatry. We love to get comfortable in sort of where we are because it offers us a sense of comfort and consistency and familiarity and home. It feels like home. Where are you doing this? The assumption of this text is that we're doing this. So where are you doing this? Israelites have gotten comfortable. If we're honest, it's so much easier than it's so much easier just to not fight sin. It's so much easier just to not fight. The Christian life, let's be honest, the Christian life is not one that's marked by victory after victory after victory. I've been watching a lot of Olympics this week. I like to think that as a Christian, I'm kind of like Katie Ledecky, right? I'm just I just win every race. I just go in the pool and I dominate and we we leave, right? I like to think of that. That's not true, though. <laughs> Sadly, my Christian life looks a lot more like judges. <laughs> One step forward, four steps back. Taylor can't get out of his own way. Taylor can't get out of his own head. That's what it looks like. And sometimes it's just easier to say, I'm going to live with that. I'm going to live with my addiction. I'm going to live with my pride. I'm going to live with my sin because it's easy. It's easy. Easy. This is a pattern that we see with the Israelites. If you know anything about the Old Testament, right? what did they do with Moses? They wandered in the wilderness. They grumbled. And what did they actually, they got to the point where they said, take us back to Egypt. Insane. We want to be slaves again. Nobody ever said that. Well, I guess they kind of did. Right? Because slavery is not hard. <laughs> it is hard in a lot of ways, but it's not hard in the sense of, it's not really costly, right? You just, you just kind of live in the same life. At least you got food. At least you got a place to sleep, right? In the case of, uh, in the, case of the Israelites here, we've seen a, a group that's just resigned. They've decided that slavery and oppression is who they are, and that's what they're going to do. Praise be to God, He didn't let them stay there. 
We'll get there in a second. Let's talk about Samson for a minute. In Samson, as we saw the Israelites being completely unwilling for salvation, we see in Samson being completely unwilling to be a Savior. Chapter 13, we get the account of Samson's birth. And you may have been confused for a second because you might have thought we flipped to the Gospel of Luke, right? Here we have this, what is this account, right? An angel of the Lord appears to a barren woman to to say you're going to have a child and that child is going to save his people. Heard that one before? Right? We're establishing patterns. It's pretty cool. But it's not just that we're going to, to, to give you a child, right? To conceive, to save his people. But he actually goes as far as to say that we want him set apart, right? He says he will be a Nazarite to the Lord. A Nazarite, if you want to go read more details, is in Numbers chapter 6. This description of uh, what it is to be a Nazarite. Nazarite could be a man or a woman. The three things sort of Nazarites did they avoided haircuts, alcohol, and touching dead things. Those are the three things that all Nazarites had to avoid forever. That's what it was kind of outlined uh, there in number six. And that's you see that in the text in chapter 13, telling Samson's mother uh, that this is what ought to be kind of stayed away from. The ironic thing we see in the story of Samson that we've seen in the rest of Judges is that there is nobody that's more qualified to be a deliverer than Samson. You're a Nazarite to God. You've got this incredible birth story. You're strong beyond belief, which we'll see as we go forward. Uh, In the texts we read today, we saw him kill a thousand people with the jawbone of a donkey, rip a lion apart like a young goat, because that's something we all understand. I'm glad that that's the way the text helped us to understand what it looked like when he ripped apart the young goat. Uh, That's one of my favorite new expressions, by the way. We've been saying it kind of around the house, but like, ripped apart that tortilla like you would a young goat. Um, but anyway, so I like, <laughs> I like that detail in the text. But anyway, we see Samson is strong beyond belief, right? He's charismatic. He's good looking, right? He's everything you want in a deliverer, literally everything, except one problem. He doesn't want to be a deliverer. He wants to do everything else. He wants to use all of these gifts, all of these abilities for himself, all of these things. We see in the uh, beginning of the text we read in in chapter 14 how he sees this woman of the Philistines and he tells his parents, and I love how stern the Hebrew is here where he says to his parents, go get her. (laughs) Go get her. On one hand, it's a horribly misogynistic way to say it, but on another hand, he just sounds like a spoiled brat. Heard a story of my friend who took, he he went to a basketball game when he he was younger it was an NBA game, and he heard these kids behind him crying to their dad, Daddy, make them win. Daddy, make them win. Right? This is what I hear from Samson. Like I, I know like most people will hear this, and they're like, oh, he's a misogynist. He's horrible. And yes, all that's true. But I hear the, Daddy, go get her for me. Spoiled brat. Thinks he is entitled to all of it. Go get her. And, and I love that the text literally goes out of its way to make sure we get the point. I love how Judges does this. We've seen this before. Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. That phrase tells you all you need to know. Because the the theme of Judges we've seen is this idea of people doing what is right in their own eyes. Samson literally says the quiet part out loud. Go get her. She's right in my eyes. But if you didn't, Uh, know this already about Samson. You didn't get the point. We continued reading. Yes, he tears the lion like you would tear a young goat, right? But what was one of the Nazarite vows? Don't touch what? Don't touch dead things, right? This includes actually killing something with your own bare hands. Uh, we'll see later if you read down in chapter 14, he, uh, he, there's, a, there's a hive of bees that makes honey inside the lion's carcass. And he scoops it out with his hand and he eats it and feeds it to his parents. Yeah, that's in the Bible. Um, it's disgusting, right? Anyway, the idea here is that not only does he kill the lion, but he actually like, touches the dead thing in every way. Like he scoops honey out of it, right? Nazarite vow gone in that regard. Uh, after that, he is given the Philistine woman. They get married. And uh, the text says later on that Samson throws a feast. The word that we have in English is feast. The word in the Hebrew is more like this seven-day drinking party, basically. So, so to put it uh, crassly, he throws a seven-day kegger right, for these people. 
What was another Nazarite vow? Don't drink. Nazarite vow number two, gone. Right? So you see in Samson somebody who's not only narcissistic, misogynistic, spoiled out of his mind, all about Samson, but you see somebody who is deliberately going out of his way to break the vows that he's been given to be set apart for the Lord. He is not interested in being who he was made to be. He has no interest in it. And you see this in all throughout the story of Samson. We'll see as we get into chapter 16 next time, we'll see how he goes after a prostitute and then his relationship with Delilah. The guy is a mess. Does not want to be a savior. Has no interest in that whatsoever. There's plenty of application we could give about not living out your calling. <laughs> not walking in the way that you are called. Not walking in the manner in which you were called. All right, there's all sorts of that, but really what I want us to see here is that from both the Israelites and Samson, we're seeing a desire to live in comfort and safety, even above what's good for them, even above what is right for them, even above freedom, even above all the things that come with deliverance. They would rather live in comfort and safety and pleasure and all of the things that are easy. And we're seeing this from these people. And I do, before we move on kind of to the good news, I do invite you to do some self-examination here. In what ways are you living for comfort more than you're living for God? In what ways are you living for ease more than you're living for cost? In what ways are you living for excess and not living for taking your own cross and following Jesus? This is a hard question. This is a real issue. Because the Christian life is not one of comfort. <laughs> Christian life is one of suffering, and it's one of dependence, and it's one of acknowledging your mess, and it's one of repentance, and it's one of understanding that you are not right and admitting that. Where are you living as if you're right? Where are you living as if you have it figured out? Where are you living as if you have it figured out? Right. Where are you living as if you are doing what is right in your own eyes? If we're honest with ourselves, there are just areas where we don't want to live for God's will. If we're honest with ourselves, we sin because we like to sin. And we did that before Christ, and now we're in Christ, and we're still dealing with sinful, broken hearts. We're still doing it. Pablo referenced Romans 7 earlier. What does Paul say? I do the things that I don't want to do. All right. I love uh, in Augustine's Confessions, if you've ever read that classic, where Augustine talks about when he was a teenager and he stole pears from the pear tree. And he doesn't say that, he says, I didn't steal them because I needed them. I stole them because I wanted to. Stole them because I wanted to steal. That's a picture of us. We sin because we like to sin. We sin because we want to sin. Where are we not following God's will? Fortunately, there's good news here though, and that's the second point. We don't want to be saved, but God saves us anyway. The good news is, throughout this remarkable story, is that the resigned indifference of the Israelites, the narcissistic, hedonistic self-indulgence of Samson, the remedy for all of it is the fact that God just won't get out of the story. Every time you think it's gone too far, God pops up. And it's, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's remarkable. First of all, you do have this idea in 13 verse 1 where the Israelites say, we're, just, they, we're not going to cry out, we're just done. What immediately follows that though is the account of the angel of the Lord coming to this random Danite woman to say, I'm going to give you a baby who's going to deliver the people. Immediately following this resigned silence from Israel is this proclamation that a Savior is coming. Whether you want the Savior or not, <laughs> Israel. Right? When we see, you look in the story of Samson and you get into 14 where he, he sees the Philistine woman and all of this and he's go get her and everything and they're in Timnah. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 may be the most important verse that we read right in chapter 14. After he says about the Philistine woman, go get her. His parents object. He says, no, she's right in my eyes. Go get her. And Judges, the writer of Judges gives it to us straight up. His father and mother did not know that this sin of Samson was what? From the Lord. 
Not that the Lord condones marriage to the Philistines. Hopefully you've gotten that from the rest of Judges. God does not condone marriage among peoples that are not His people, right? But God's using Samson's sin. Why? Seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. To put it very bluntly, crassly, and don't take this the wrong way, but he's picking a fight. Right? He's out to pick a fight. God's doing this. Right? And then you see, Samson goes into the vineyard. He kills the young lion after what? The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Right? And I don't know why that's there. I don't know why the Spirit of the Lord caused him to tear apart this young lion like he, you tear apart a young goat. But you see this phrase recur two other times later on in the story. Right? Hopefully you caught it. That was what I kind of based our, our reading around. If you look in, um, let's see, it's 14 verse 6. Uh, and verse 19, and then 15, chapter 14. Right? Those three places we see that phrase. The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson. And in each case, you see an escalation of what's happening. The first case, he kills the young lion. The second case, he kills 30 men. The third case, he kills 1,000 men. And you see the escalation going throughout the story. You trace it. But in every case, Samson was not looking for help. Samson was not looking to fight. Samson didn't want any of it. And yet, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. The Spirit of the Lord actively involved in the story, even though Samson is terrible. <laughs> right? He creates this whole game with the Philistines after the wedding at the drinking party where he tells them a riddle and then they, they dupe his new uh, his fiance into telling him the answer to the riddle and so he sets fire to their, uh, their town and they come back in retaliation and they set fire to his uh, wife-to-be and her dad and there's, just, there's just all this back and forth. It's horrible. It's violent. It's, it's messy. Again, I encourage you uh, to read it. But the point of all of it is that when Samson even though Samson continues to do the wrong thing over and over and over again, the Lord continues to intervene. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, right? And he's building up to this great deliverance that's going to come. The great deliverance is coming, whether Samson and the Israelites want it or not. God is ruling and overruling. This is really the whole point of Judges. This is the whole point of the Bible. This is the whole point of why we're here this morning. In a nutshell, we see in this story a snapshot of the purpose of our attendance in this place here this morning. The purpose of this entire book. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't want a Savior. We weren't looking for a Savior. We didn't ask for a Savior. We didn't come to a Savior. And yet the Savior came for us. What an incredibly transformative and beautiful thing it is to consider that God saw us in our rebellion, in our sin, in our pride, in our self-indulgence, in our narcissism, in our hedonism, in our everything that we do that reflects Samson and the Israelites a hundredfold. Everything that we do, God saw us in that. And He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. He didn't give us a to-do list to fix it. He didn't wait for, him, wait for us to come to Him. God sent the Savior. He sent the Savior for us, and the Savior, thankfully, was greater than Samson. Thankfully, the Savior is God Himself. God Himself. Dead in our trespasses, totally disinterested, the Savior shows up and He lives the perfect life and He dies the death we deserve. Three days later, He walks out of the grave so that death is defeated forever and that by faith in Him, being united to Him, we might understand what it is to be delivered even when we didn't want it. We might understand freedom even when we didn't want it. It's not enough to say simply that Jesus paid for our sin. It's not enough to simply say that Jesus did that. What it is to say is that Jesus came for us, yes, to pay for our sin, but also that when we are united in faith to Him, we're indwelt by His Holy Spirit, and He zeroes in on all the sin that we're comfortable in, all the things that we so desire, and He goes to war. 
Because that sin of success and that sin of image and that sin of faith is not going to save you. It's never going to do it and it's always going to enslave you and always going to make you less human than you are. Jesus comes in and He goes to war. So that your need for success, your need for status, your self-centered, Americanized hopes and dreams have a target on their back. And it's not that we lose part of ourselves when Jesus goes to war with those things. It's that we actually gain humanity. We actually gain who we are. We actually gain who we're supposed to be. We actually understand and know something of what God created us for, even now. Jesus comes to kill the thing that is seeking to kill us. While we were sleeping to the thing that was ready to devour us, Christ came to save us. This is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. This is thankfully the story of judges in the, in the entire Bible. So we see it time and time again. The good news is that God cares about your welfare way more than you ever will. God cares about your good and He wants your good more than you could. God loves you more than you ever will. That's why He came after us. That's why we'll be celebrating at the table in a few minutes. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You have a great need for a Savior, but you have a great Savior for your need. Let's pray.